Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. All right. Good afternoon. Thank you for being here. Uh, sorry to keep you waiting for a little while. Uh, we are here to announce the arrest of Carlos Montalvo Rivera, 52-year-old Lancaster City resident for homicide and related charges for the killing of his wife, Olga Sanchez, on December 6, 2010. He was arrested without incident this morning at about 5.29 a.m. I'm joined uh, at this press conference with our District Attorney Craig Stedman, First Assistant District Attorney Travis Anderson, the Lead Case Investigator, Detective Sergeant Nickel, his Captain Mike Winters, and his Lieutenant Richard Mendez. This arrest reflects the dedication and determination of our detectives to bring those to justice who caused the death of another person, and a majority of that credit, in this case, goes to Detective Sergeant Nickel. It is not lost on us that this arrest will reignite or intensify feelings and emotion for the family members and friends of Olga, Olga Sanchez. We never take these cases lightly, and we continue to work them long after the crime scene tape has been removed and the victim's memory only stays fresh in the minds of their family, friends, and the investigators that work the case, and the assistant district attorneys who are also involved. I first want to thank Detective Sergeant Nickel for continuing to work this case for the last nine years and his staunch advocacy for Olga Sanchez, the victim. I would also like to thank the other detectives from our agency and the other investigative agencies that assisted us on this case to include the Lancaster City Fire Bureau, Pennsylvania State Police, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms and Explosives, investigators and attorneys with the District Attorney's Office. I also want to acknowledge the leadership of Captain Mike Winters from our Criminal Investigative Division and Chief uh, Ken Schweitzer from the Lancaster County Detectives. Their assistance with managing this case early on and throughout the past several years certainly helped get us where we are today. I would also ask that the media uh, please respect the privacy of the families and witnesses involved in this case and please try and refrain, refrain uh, from printing or mentioning their names uh, in any of your publications. This will help protect the integrity of the case as it proceeds through the courts. We know today is an emotional day for the families involved. We also recognize that we have more work ahead of us as we prepare this case for trial. We also want to send the message to other families who are waiting for justice in inactive or cold cases or those unsolved cases uh, that we still have. We are still working them, uh, as example by this case. We have not forgotten about your loved ones. And as we do with every press conference involving a homicide or a major crime. If anyone has any information about this case with Olga Sanchez or any other homicide cases, to please call us or contact us through our website, social media, Crime Stoppers, or Crime Watch. And now I'll turn it over to District Attorney Craig Stedman. Thank you, Chief. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thanks for being patient, uh, waiting for us. First thing I want to say is what I have to say and, and truly believe in all cases, uh, the defendant is presumed innocent of all these charges until he's uh, found guilty and uh, that's an important part of our process. Filing charges is just the first step. Uh, we have a lot more work to do. I also want to uh, commend the, the city police, in particular Detective Sergeant Nickel, who um, has worked relentlessly on this case nonstop from the beginning. I've had uh, countless meetings with him over the years. and. I wouldn't classify, I think I could understand why my people might say this was a, a so-called cold case. Uh, one of the things that, that I can tell you is it's never been forgotten and every year there have been some type of either meeting or activity or um, uh, discussion between um, Detective Sergeant Nickel, myself and or my office about what steps we need to take, what needs to be done uh, next. And, and we've gone through this year after year meticulously, piece by piece looking for uh, what evidence we have, what we don't have, uh, but we've met regularly. The most recent uh, meeting was uh, Detective Sergeant Nickel asked to meet with me in August. Uh, we met in September. We had um, a couple things to do. He, he did those things, and we still have more to do, and we're still looking for more information, but uh, his determination and never forgetting this case is, is really you know, why we're here today. I think the chief is absolutely correct. This is just a, a, a terribly emotional case by everybody involved in this. Um, we are fortunate and have to remember that this could have been far, far worse and that you had, it could have been many, many more deaths, including the deaths of uh, three children, three innocent children. We had heroism 
um, by the by Mr. Santiago, the neighbor, as well as those those kids, who literally their lives were were on the line. And of course, as we as he said, we respect you respect their um, their privacy and in, in their names um, as well. This isn't uh, anything but a circumstantial case, and a circumstantial case takes time to build. You guys have had the affidavit for most of the day, I imagine, so I don't intend to go through um, all of the details in there, but one thing that I, I, I do want to stress and emphasize that was important to um, my review of this and First Assistant Travis Anderson's review, and he'll be actually handling the case and has taken over the case uh, recently from another uh, from the previous first assistant um, was that the defendant in this case, um, his story was uh, that he had been knocked unconscious for about what would have been about 45 minutes um, and tied up. And you've read that he gives four different versions about whether he was tied up, when he was tied up, how he was tied up, whether he was loosened and all that. Um, but there was no, he had no evidence whatsoever of any kind of head injury. Um, there was no debris on him consistent with him being burned. There were no burns. There was no smoke inhalation damage on him. None of this was consistent with the story of, of what he was saying. And as you can see in the affidavit, they uh, recently went back and talked to the neurologists uh, involved in this case. And he, what the medical science is not backing up what the defendant is claiming that he'd been knocked unconscious for 45 minutes, which is an excessive uh, long time for a significant head injury. I mean, you look at, at what takes place on the football field um, every week you see those guys get knocked into a concussion for maybe they're out for seconds and, and they're completely in another universe walking off um, the field. 45 minutes is a long time to be knocked out and uh, the medical evidence is important to us in, in making the decision to go ahead and authorize uh, charges in this. I want to emphasize that again as though it seemed maybe perhaps seemed to the public that nothing was being done in this case. We had met and been in touch with the family regularly um, as to far as to updating them, as to what we were doing and what we could tell them. You know from the affidavit as well, we took this case in front of the grand jury um, a few years ago uh, to, as, as part of the efforts to investigate it. And that's one of the things I think the chief emphasized as well, is that there are just some things we can't tell families. Um, but just because it, their charges haven't been filed doesn't mean that, that we haven't been working on it um, and it isn't at the forefront of our minds and we attempt to bring justice to each and every one of um, the families who have lost a loved one and that person as well and to make our streets safer and that's what this is all about. So one of the things that sort of um, this case comes down to and it's harder to articulate in an affidavit but in a way many times time works against us. Um, in this case uh, I would say the opposite is true and as time went by um, every time we reviewed this case, every time we looked at the evidence um, the finger of guilt kept, kept coming back to one person, the same person, the person that we've charged. And there was no other evidence of anybody else. If you read the affidavit, uh, according to uh, you know, the, the evidence that we have, we had evidence that there, you know, there was apparently an uh, alleged threat to other members of the family. Well, nothing else has happened to anybody else from the individuals that were supposedly in the house. I think an important thing to note as well as, according to the defendant, it would have been at least two individuals that would have had to enter the house um, to, to cause the, the homicide and our review of all the surveillance film. Although it's not perfect, there is no evidence of any of two or more people going into that house during, during that surveillance. So a lot of this is sort of, again, what they say, kind of no one else could have done it category. And of course, there's a motive as well that's outlined um, in the affidavit. Uh, uh, and when you put it all together, it came to the inescapable conclusion that charges are warranted in this case. Um, again, he's presumed innocent, and this is going to be, the, you know, this is what we have a system for. Um, he'll be entitled to his preliminary hearing, and then it'll be up to a jury um, to decide ultimate responsibility. All we can do is bring the evidence before them. And we feel at this time that the evidence was appropriate thing to do. The only thing to do <coughs> was, to, was to file the charges. So um, with that, I think we can open it up for questions. Craig, is there something different that you would take it uh, to charges now versus 10 years ago when the evidence does seem to be the same as, as what you presented here? Sure. Yeah, it's a great question. I, I think um, I tried to answer it a little bit in anticipation of it. Not everything that we have is in our affidavit. We can really only discuss what we have in the affidavit. I can tell you 
um, that there are other things that we asked done recently and we have done. Um, one of the things that was more recent was uh, the, uh, her sister that in 2016 came forward and said you know, there was a threat to, to kill her. Um, so that was relatively new. The other thing was we had asked them to go back and, and have a more detailed interview with um, the neurologist in particular, which was just done in, I believe, September. Um, uh, so the, the, the doc, that was another, would have been another question. The doctors were talked to at the beginning of this. Doctors it, were talked to. Just not now. And, 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 but I actually, uh, Detective Sergeant Nicola asked to talk to me in August. We came back in September. I said, I want you to go back to the doctors. This is his story. That he's been, you know, science has come a long way. Neurology has come a long way in nine, ten years. And I said, maybe things have changed scientifically. Maybe, you know, I'm imagining, I'm not a, a doctor, but they may know more. His story is he was knocked unconscious to the point where he was out for about 45 minutes. That's a significant head trauma. I want to hear from the experts in the field now, in 2019, not just what they said back then, as to what, whether that is likely or not. And you can read from the affidavit, it's just, it's just like, no, it's, that's highly unlikely. Uh, for him to be walking around coherent as he was after this, have just no evidence of head trauma. So I feel more confident in that now in 2019 than before. And the other thing was, honestly, as I said, um, one of the things is eliminating the possibility that other people did this. And, and there were threats to other family members. Nothing has taken place. So you know, this case has always been um, at, the, at the cusp of, of of charging and um, we've debated it back and forth um, but the evidence is un undoubtedly stronger today than it was nine years ago five years ago two years ago and and again we don't put everything um, in in the affidavit do you think that's what made it so difficult to solve this case almost <clears throat> a decade later but what was it that was so difficult to solve yeah, I mean, any circumstantial case is, is more difficult. You don't have an eyewitness. You don't have, a, you know, someone saying, coming forward, and I'm accepting responsibility for this. Anytime you have a circumstantial case, it becomes a challenge for uh, us as prosecutors and the police as well. And we want to be, we want to make sure, you know, we believe in the presumption of innocence. And the last thing we ever want to do is charge an innocent person and, and certainly convict an innocent person. So we take these responsibilities very seriously, and we have um, multiple discussions on it, and that's what behind the scenes picture you wouldn't know. I mean, we just spent countless hours talking about what else we do. And there are many, many other things um, that may well come out of trial that I just can't go into um, today. But it's a great question. How frustrating was this for you? I think this is one of the cases that anybody that covered from the media, anybody that's involved in the community that know the individuals, anybody that read about this story with the children and fire, um, and, then, and then not solving it, the potential for far worse damages. I mean, this is, all murders are significant, they're all important, but there's just no question that this one has stood out in the memories of so many people in the community. Do you think he didn't care if his kids got killed? Were they just part of getting rid of his wife? I think that I, I could answer that question, but I, the appropriate answer for that question would be a trial. And, and um, I think that that goes a little bit too far for me um, within the boundaries of ethical restrictions to, to do it. A, uh, press conference. So I have an answer to your question. I don't think it's appropriate for me to do it or fair to the defendant for me to do that at this time. Did the uh, grand jury recommend um, not charging or did they make any sort of recommendation that, that impacted your decision to, I guess, not charge at that time? So I have to be careful again with the grand jury. That was we, um, as to what I can say and what I can't say, we released a statement. I can tell you that we work with the grand jury very closely and in all cases and when they give us input on cases, we take that seriously and follow up with it, and this case would be included as well. So I just generally speaking, do grand juries make recommendations for you guys to charge? Um, so or generally, we could talk about generally speaking. So generally speaking, you can handle it a couple of ways. You can go to a grand jury and you can ask for what's called a presentment, which is a, in, in essence a recommendation from them to charge. You could not ask them for a presentment and just put on the witnesses and see what happens. You can also have candid conversations with grand juries and just say, what do you think? You know, what should we be doing? What are your thoughts? Do you think he or she did it? And I can't tell you what was done in, in okay. this case because we don't have the court order to release that. But that's generally what we do. It's a tremendously valuable tool for us in Lancaster to have an investigative grand jury. I think we should essentially have it uh, round the clock, but there's a resource issue, and of course the president judge has to approve it. Um, do we know what caused the fire? 
Uh, Tell uh, us that. An accelerant. Um, did we determine exactly? I'm sorry. Whether you said there was a smell of gasoline, yes. but I, I just didn't know if uh, you had details on that that you could release with us. Uh, the only thing, the details I could release are what's in the affidavit. We know an accelerant was used. Uh, it, it would be consistent with gasoline. Can you tell me if you took this before uh, a second or a third or a, another grand jury besides the one mentioned? Um, I cannot. Um, I cannot tell you that. We can. We are. <laughs> there's there's a whole different set of rules for that. We can only discuss what we got permission from the president judge to release, which is what we put in the affidavit. So I can only talk about the grand jury in general terms. Do you know? Does he have a a, a lawyer? Uh, I don't. I don't know that, but he will be automatically qualified for one since he's incarcerated. Okay. Craig, what do you make about the fact that, I mean, as you said, he changed his story many times, but yet he has stuck to his story of innocence? Well, I think, you know, we, we look at all those things, and you have to consider all those things, but when you change your story one time to a second version, now to a third version, now to a fourth version, which is what we have in this case, it certainly um, tilts the scales of justice towards guilt rather than the opposite, as opposed to just somebody saying, Here's my version, and this is what happened. Now, you know, again, that's just one part of the case, and it's a circumstantial case that all goes together, but we have at least four versions of what he's saying about his hands, and you have to remember that also is in conjunction with the way he says he got out of the house through the window, which was shut. We know it was shut afterwards, so what? He jumped out the window with his hands tied and then took the time to shut it afterwards? I mean, this just doesn't make any sense. That never made any sense to begin with, and there was... You know, look, I'll be candid. There was people who, that were saying, well, let's charge right at that time, based on that time, based on that alone. And I'm not saying they're wrong. All we can say is this is the evidence we have at this point in time, and this is what we were comfortable with uh, in, uh, in, in approving the charges for, based on these current facts, 2019. Is that like a case of, like, look, I know you did it. You know he did it, but we might have problems convincing a jury he did it. Is that... It in a nutshell as far as back then for you guys? I, I don't know whether I would want to characterize like that far. What I can talk to you about is what evidence we have and that we feel there's probable cause to charge him for this and that there needs to, the justice system needs to play out. I mean, obviously we've had many discussions about the strengths and weaknesses of the case. I don't think it's appropriate for me to go into the details or important. What's important is the facts that we have, what we've got to, to look forward to. I mean, there's certainly no question that we don't have a videotape of anybody perpetrating this crime. What we do have is a lot of evidence that when you combine it, paints one a picture of guilt for one person. If I could ask Detective Nickel a question, sure. what what or I'm sure all cases are important to you, but what uh, what made you tenacious you on, on this right, case? Please. I'm sorry. What what made you tenacious on on this case more so than any others, if that's even accurate? Sure. I mean, I can speak for all detectives. I'm not going to answer this. I mean, we live these cases. Um, we eat, sleep, <laughs> you know, <clears throat> we're getting phone calls from witnesses, um, family members, uh, on our personal cell phones at home. I mean, we take these cases to heart. It's not like we just come to work and punch in and, and work the cases and then go home. We're talking to these witnesses and concerned people for years and years um, that have information that are checking on about the case and we, and we do what we can. Uh, for those family members, uh, you know, in this case, you know, for the for the brothers and the sisters of Olga and, and, and her children. Uh, some of those children have taken to social media and have been saying they, you know, they don't believe this. They they are in support of their father. Um, any comment on on that? Anybody? I mean, unfortunately, for some cases um, like this one, uh, we just have to be very reserved on what information we release to family members. Um, especially to children, mm -hmm. um, you know, with living conditions and such, you know, who, who they're living with, we just have to be real careful in what we release. Any idea what a possible motive may have been in this case? Uh, yes, uh, there was uh, marital problems between uh, Olga and Carlos that had been building for some time uh, that I had interviewed uh, several witnesses about that and, and outlined that, and that was um, I touched on that a little bit on the affidavit with that argument that the sister had witnessed a year before um, with the threats and there was also um, sometimes where uh, Carlos had actually moved out of the, the residence so and that was inconsistent with his interviews. More than once moving out, so something about moving out about a month before, he had been out before that even? Yes. Yeah, and his and remember his he told the police that 
they were happily married as well. So yeah. he, he concealed that from the from the beginning. Do you have any better idea of just how she died? Whether she died in the prior to this fire being set? Or uh, the re doctor found that she died died from thermal uh, injuries as well as smoke inhalation. Um, the the body unfortunately was burned, so we don't have enough to say whether there was trauma. There may well have been trauma to her be beforehand, but she was burned. So we don't have the evidence that we typically have from most autopsies. So she was burned beyond the ability that you could determine if she had been assaulted or strangled or something um, like that? Much of her was burned. Okay. Some parts were not mm -hmm. as much as but others. If she had smoke inhalation, that would indicate that she had been alive. Yes, sir. I mean, is it the belief that she was sleeping or that, and that fire was set, or do you just don't know? Um, no, I don't. We don't believe that she was that she was sleeping, but it's certainly quite possible that she was unconscious and had been assaulted and unconscious. Um, that would be a, a certain it certainly a possibility. The she didn't escape. Right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Anything else? Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you.